my water just broke. I felt like things really intensified. She was right there and she was coming. It was, it was an amazing feeling. I'm gonna cry just thinking about it. I could feel her head. We heard her cry. We were squeezing hands and she was screaming. <laughs> I'm Bryn Hunt Palmer and you're listening to The Birth Hour. This podcast is designed as a safe place to come together and share childbirth stories. Stick around and join us to hear informative and empowering birth journeys from all over the world. Today's episode is sponsored by Motif Medical. Motif designs insurance eligible products for busy moms. With a focus on innovation and empowerment, Motif's line of breast pumps and maternity compression garments are sophisticated yet discreet and made to support mothers as they navigate new motherhood. Discover why moms are reporting more milk in less time with the Luna Breast Pump and see how you can get it covered through insurance at motifmedical.com slash birth hour. At the end of this episode, I'll have more information about the Luna Breast Pump from Motif Medical. The Birth Hour's Know Your Options Childbirth course is still available. You can find that at thebirthhour.com slash course. And you can use the coupon code 100 off for $100 off your purchase of that course. You get lifetime access and it's immediate access. If for some reason you don't get the email right away to log in, just look in your spam folder. I've had a few people message me about that recently. Um, Or you can always message me for support as well. I also want to remind everyone about the option to become a Patreon member. This is where you pledge a monthly dollar amount, or there are also annual memberships, which through the end of this month are as discounted as they can possibly get. You get two months free with those. And with these different things, you get special perks like access to our archived episodes, membership in our private Facebook group and bonus content, including a special podcast my husband hosts called The Partner Podcast. That's for our co-producer level. So you can see all of this information at patreon.com slash birth hour. And today's guest, Melissa, is actually one of our Patreon members. So I believe she mentions it a couple of times during her episode. It's such a great group and we just love connecting there. We also do Zoom calls each month so that we can see each other face to face and chat about all things you know, trying to conceive, pregnancy, motherhood. No topic is really off limits in there. So we would love to welcome you into that group. So head over to patreon.com slash birth hour to find all that information. Okay, let's get to today's episode with Melissa. She's going to be sharing her hospital birth story during COVID. And she unexpectedly ended up in the OR because of some D cells with her baby's heart rate, but she did have a vaginal delivery in there. So let's hear from Melissa. Hi, Melissa. Welcome to the birth hour. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. Hi, Bryn. Thank you. I'm so excited. Great. Will you start by telling listeners a little bit about you and your family? Absolutely. Yes. Hi, everybody. My name is Melissa Knoll. I live in Minneapolis, Minnesota uh, with my husband, Mark, and my son, Emerson, who's now 16 months, and our dog, Griffey. I work at the Mayo Clinic, and I work with clinicians on new uh, innovative care models and bringing new clinical services to life. My background is actually in engineering. I studied biomedical engineering and then mechanical engineering at the University of Pennsylvania, and then did an MBA program at the um, University of St. Thomas in Minneapolis. Uh, and then in my free time, I like to compete in triathlons, and I'm definitely an outdoorsy person. I love to spend time outside with my family, and I also love to travel. All right. Well, let's hear about your pregnancy, finding out you're pregnant. How did that go for you? Sure. So I got pregnant at the end of 2019 and it started a little bit frustratingly. I I think like many people, I always thought that the day that I decided to get pregnant would be the, the day that I got pregnant. And <laughs> it took a few months for my body to kind of work out the hormones from birth control. So it was five months later, which at the time seemed like an eternity, but uh, I think it was just kind of lack of education on that. So when I got pregnant, I was super excited. <laughs> Fun fact, I never even got a period. So didn't even know that I was able to get pregnant, but all of a sudden I was. Uh, but again, we were really excited. And uh, we were able to tell all of our families at Christmas, which was a blast. And then I, uh, I was a little bit nauseous for 16 weeks, like the first 16 weeks of pregnancy. Uh, I, I got motion sickness in cars and airplanes, which was weird for me. And I, I actually work 95 miles away from home. So that <laughs> was a little bit inconvenient, but got through it. 
I kept traveling even while I was pregnant. So I, I visited like five or six states uh, early in pregnancy. And then COVID hit when I was 22 weeks pregnant. So that definitely, you know, threw a wrench into things, um, just like I did for a lot of people. But for the most part, it actually wasn't nothing too crazy. And I, and I think part of it was that it was my first pregnancy. So people would say to me, oh, it must be so weird to be pregnant during COVID. And, and I'd say, well, I don't really know anything different. So <laughs> didn't seem all that weird to me. Yeah, I'm sure not having to do that commute was one small silver lining too. Yes, that was a huge blessing. My mom likes to give me a hard time that uh, things work out for me where, you know, I get pregnant and (laughs) all of a sudden a pandemic hits and therefore I don't need to commute anymore. So yeah, that's uh, worked out really well. But I really did have a pretty textbook pregnancy. I was running and swimming until the the very end, including the day before I went into labor. I, I was at the swimming pool and I did my last run at 39 weeks and I was lucky that I actually went into labor exactly at 40 weeks because I would have had to uh, go for another run just to say that I did. (laughs) But I really felt like all that exercise and activity was beneficial for me. It actually helped a ton with the nausea and I was very thankful that I was in good shape for uh, delivery, but I'll get into that later. During my pregnancy, I was, you know, doing a lot of prep work. I did a couple classes near the end, I was listening to like three episodes a day of of birth hour. So uh, thank you, Bryn. (laughs) Awesome. Yeah. That really helped me start formulating what an ideal birth experience would look like for me. And actually the beginning of my pregnancy, I had been assuming that I would get an epidural because that's what I thought everybody did. And uh, through the birth hour and through a couple of friends and actually my mom, I heard so many empowering stories of uh, women who went uh, and did an, an unmedicated birth, you know, for a while I was thinking like, can I do this? And I, I was kind of giving myself some pep talks around, you know, I, I do triathlons, I'm in good shape, I can do this, billions of people do this, I can do this if I want to do it. And uh, I decided around like 25 or 30 weeks into pregnancy that that's what I wanted. At the same time, I was working with an OB who I'd been seeing for uh, seven years uh, ever since I graduated from college. And I really liked her. I had a really good relationship with her. She was a very direct communicator, which I appreciated and thought would be a good thing for me during birth. I think I would have considered a birth center instead of a hospital if COVID wasn't going on. But I, since I, I work for a hospital, I've spent a lot of time in hospitals through work. I really trusted hospitals and knew that uh, they were doing everything that they could to you know, keep things clean and make sure that COVID precautions were in place. And I also just wanted to have everything in one place, you know, just in case, because logistics just seem much more complicated with COVID. So um, I ended up going with hospital birth and, and I was glad that I did. And uh, another complicating part about COVID, I was actually probably more anxious about the COVID aspects of giving birth than I was the actual birth. I felt like I, I had really prepared myself well for the birth, but with COVID, there's so many unknowns. And the biggest piece that gave me anxiety was wearing a mask during labor. So I think leading up to birth, I was in your uh, birth hour Facebook group asking everybody, like, did you have to wear a mask? And, you know, trying to find mom groups in the Twin Cities, like trying to figure out, did people wear a mask? Like what happened with all the COVID protocols when you gave birth? There's so little information around it. And that, that part made me really nervous, but I felt as ready as I could be for labor and delivery, which is great. And part of what helped with that was that we we brought a doula on board around 36 weeks. Again, something that I never really thought would be in my plan. But after I'd done so much listening and talking with other people, she ended up being just a total godsend. and, And I'll talk much more about that. But at the end of pregnancy, she was super helpful with uh, educating us around, you know, what really happens with birth. For some reason, the the classes that I did over Zoom, they just weren't all that, I don't know, like real life seeming. And she answered all of our kind of silly questions for us who were first time parents and brand new to birth. And she uh, kind of helped me get ready for birth and did things like the miles circuit and, and other things to help me get ready in those final days. So pregnancy, again, was pretty easy, pretty textbook, uh, learned a ton and um, was feeling pretty good for the birth experience. Awesome. All right. Well, let's go ahead and hear about labor starting for you then. Yeah. Labor, I uh, I thought that my baby would be early and, and we found out early on that we were going to have a boy. Uh, so 
I was early. My husband came early. So waiting was really hard because I thought for sure he'd be early, but made the most of it. I was like, taking a lot of me time. And then I lost my mucus plug on a Wednesday, which is two days before my due date and called my doula. She said, Oh, that means typically that you'll have your baby within 24 to 48 hours. And I was like, Oh, awesome. I had originally called my OB and there. They couldn't really give me that information, but again, uh, doula was there to the rescue. So mucus plug on Wednesday. And then I had really bad lightning crotch all the next day that Thursday. And I only bring it up because nobody talks about it. And it's a kind of a jarring thing when it happens, but uh, that was an early sign for me. And then Thursday, near the end of work, I was starting to feel some kind of pressure around my belly and I was just ignoring it, thinking, oh, these are just, you know, regular pregnancy pains. There's so many weird, (laughs) weird pains with pregnancy. And my husband said, you know, do you think those could be contractions? I was like, no, there's no way these are contractions. Like contractions are supposed to be terrible, right? And he's like, maybe you should just time them. And I was like, yeah, I guess. So I timed them and they weren't regular, but they were regular enough to know that they were actually contractions. And um, so I told Nicole, my doula, she said, go to bed early so you know you can rest up. You'll probably be waking up early uh, the next day. Sure enough, 2 a.m., I woke up with some like pretty intense contractions. And they were, I tried timing them on my app. They're anywhere between 7 and 15 minutes apart and like 30 seconds each. So I was able to drift in and out of sleep a little bit. I ended up, as they were getting worse, I went to a, a spare bedroom that we had in our house. It had a, a bathroom attached to it, which was really convenient because then I could let my husband keep sleeping. I didn't really need him at that point. And I ended up laboring a little bit on the toilet, which made my contractions hurt not as bad because I felt like my body was a little bit relaxed. So that was great. And then around 4.30, I had been kind of dozing for a while. 4.30, my contractions were all of a sudden like three or five minutes apart. And I was like, oh my God. <laughs> so I woke up my husband and I said, hey, do you want to have a baby today? And he's like, yeah, yeah, let's have a baby. And and I was like, okay, how about now? And he's like, now? And I was like, now, we're going to the hospital now. <laughs> like these contractions are coming. So, but still he was... <laughs> He was slow. He's going to kill me for saying this, but he was like, you know, can I take a shower? Can I brush my teeth? And I was like, oh my God. So I left my app out and all of a sudden a message came up on the app saying, go to the hospital now. And he saw it and he's like, oh my God. (laughs) So that sped him up. We called the doctor. I um, tried to get into the car between contractions. Didn't quite make it. I got in the car, drove like crazy. My husband um, was like swerving all over the freeway, almost missed the exit we got to the hospital. He almost drove down a one way. I had to say like, no, that's a one way. Don't drive down there. The whole thing was pretty painful too. You know, hitting, it felt like we hit every pothole along the way. And we, we called Nicole, uh, our doula along the way. And she said, do you want me to come now? Or do you want me to wait and, and see how things are going? And I was like, I think you need to come now. Like I, I had this feeling that things were moving pretty fast. So she, she got right in the car. We pulled into the, the front hospital area I, I sat in the car until contraction finished and then got out, raced in, hardly made it to the, the front desk, which was actually a security desk, and like collapsed on the security desk, which might have scared the security guy a little bit, but did what I could. And then I got up to triage, which uh, triage was kind of a frustrating experience, and I feel like this is pretty common too, but it's just an uncomfortable little room. There are tons of tests and questions going on. And at the same time, I was having contractions like two or three minutes apart by this time. And there's nobody there to support the birth that was going on. They were just trying to ask me questions between contractions. And I was also annoyed that there was a question of whether or not I'd be admitted. Like to me, there was definitely a baby coming and what what did they think was going on? But I you know they have their protocols and all that, but I finally got in. It felt like forever, but it was, it was really only maybe half hour, hour. I remember I had to walk to my room and I was like collapsing all over the hallway, like falling against the walls. <laughs> but I got to the room and they did a quick um, cervical check and found out that I was four centimeters dilated, which was awesome as a you know starting point. And I handed out my birth plan to everybody, had it printed out. I met the nurses and the nurses were so great. Jenny was our nurse. She was from South Africa. She read my birth plan 
And she looked at me straight in the eye. And after seeing that, you know, I indicated that I wanted an unmedicated birth. She said, you can do this. We're all here to support you and your goals. You will do this. And like, I'm almost crying thinking about it. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. It made me so much more confident, you know, that an actual medical professional um, thought that I could do it and, mm-hmm. and that they were there to support me in it. So yeah, that was, that was awesome. And everybody at the hospital kept saying that it was so great that I had spontaneous labor, which was, I thought kind of a funny word, but Mm -hmm. (laughs) spontaneous, but so it just wasn't what I expected that, you know, this um, very standard hospital was so supportive of me having this unmedicated birth. So that was really great. And then I was in the room for a little while. I was firmly clamped to the side of the hospital bed and like in just, you know, a ton of pain trying to get through contractions on my own. And I knew that I shouldn't be attached to the the side of the bed. Like I was curled up in a fetal position, couldn't move, just trying to get through one contraction after the other. And uh, my husband knew the same thing. You know, both of us were like, we shouldn't be doing this, but didn't really know what else to do and, and how, to, how to kind of resolve the situation. But then my doula, Nicole, showed up at like 7 a.m. So we got to the hospital at 6. Nicole showed up at 7, which is amazing. And I saw her. And she was like an angel walking into the room. I mean, she brought this sense of calm and assuredness and confidence that she'd done this before. We would do this together that everything was going to be okay. And that was fantastic. Uh, so she, uh, she talked me off the ledge. She <laughs> coaxed me away from like holding on for dear life to this hospital bed. And she helped enforce good breathing. And I knew that I should be, you know, practicing my J breathing and, you know, those nice long breaths. It was one thing to know it and another thing to actually do it. <laughs> but she, um, she actually pushed on my shoulders and made, made like a, noise, like a really deep breathing noise. And that made me breathe out and actually do the good breathing that I knew that I should be doing. One of my first questions to her too was, uh, which was kind of silly looking back, but I asked her, you know, I was trying to like kind of make conversation and work in there how much longer she thought I'd be in labor (laughs) because I, I felt like I could do another few hours without an epidural, but not 10 or 20 or, you know, some of the stories of labor going much longer. And in my head, I, I wasn't like, I knew that I wanted to try with an epidural, but I wasn't, you know, I wasn't going to be super sad if, if I decided to have an epidural for whatever reason, like I was fine with that. But she looked at me and said, Melissa, it doesn't matter how much longer you're going to be in this contraction or in labor or in this phase. We're just going to get through one contraction at a time. And she was so right in that. She made me realize that being present was the most important thing. Focusing on the present made me much less anxious. And it was also very similar to triathlons, which is kind of silly, but with triathlons, it's one foot in front of the other. You don't think about like, oh, I have five more hours of doing this. (laughs) It's um, just one moment at a time. So um, without that mindset, I absolutely would have gotten the epidural otherwise. And I know without having a doula there, I absolutely would have gotten an epidural. So, but I, I ended up, I guess I'll skip to the punchline. I made it through without the medication, which is really awesome. So anyway, then Nicole came at like seven. I met my doctor at around eight. And unfortunately I didn't get to have my doctor that I'd been working with um, for years and years, like I said, but it was with somebody from her practice. And we were pretty sure that that would be the case because with COVID, her practice of seven people, they were each taking a day in the hospital. So unless the day that I went into labor happened to match up with my doctor's day, it was most likely that I would have a different doctor. But I did like her a lot. And uh, she did a, a cervical check and I was already at six centimeters at 8 a.m. But she did have a little bit of bad news, which is that I was developing preeclampsia. My blood pressure came back a little bit elevated. I think it was in the 140s. And I had two liver labs that came back with elevated protein. And they did another blood pressure check right then and there. And my blood pressure came back lower, which was good. So they said that I could kind of keep going on as normal. They would just need to monitor me continuously, which, you know, in my head, I've read that um, continuous monitoring isn't necessarily the best thing, but I said, you know, that's fine. And and I decided if they were making any snap decisions based on that monitoring, I would ask a lot of questions. And they also mentioned that I might need magnesium, which I knew was a hard pass for me, if not all possible. But uh, they said the best solution was to stay relaxed and, and just get the baby out. And I was like, all right, well, definitely working on that. So 
And on the relaxation topic, my doula, Nicole, helped me create a really calming space in the labor and delivery room. I had tea lights everywhere, and she brought essential oils that she put on my wrists. And the lighting in the room was terrible. There was basically a spotlight down on the bed. I was like, how can anybody relax if there's literally a spotlight? So turn that right off. And we also had the music going. I had a really great birth playlist with some kind of calming, kind of uh, croony kind of songs. And and that really helped me to kind of center myself in between contractions, uh, gave me something that was familiar. So would definitely recommend all of those things. Those worked really well. And then we started kind of getting a little bit more creative on positions. So after Nicole talked me off the ledge with being curled up in a ball and hanging tight to the hospital bed, she started doing hip squeezes, which was amazing. I did not know how much I could love (laughs) a hip squeeze, but it ended up being that I was completely addicted to them. They made contractions feel so much less painful, just a lot less pressure. So Nicole and my husband, Mark, would take turns doing hip squeezes on me. I'm sure that they were sore the next day. I mean, they did so much (laughs) squeezing, but it was amazing. I knew that I I really wanted to labor in the tub a little bit. So uh, that was the first place that I I went, and uh, the tub was really great, too. The contractions were still strong, but definitely a lot duller. And it's just nice to be a little bit more relaxed. And Nicole put some water in my low back, which felt really good. And then just as I, I swear, I was like, just getting into it. Nicole was like, all right, it's time to get out and do a different position. I was like, what? But by this point, I trusted her so much that I would do whatever she wanted. So she had me labor backwards on the toilet with a pillow to hang on to. And I could kind of like rest my head and my upper body on the pillow. And that was also really great. It just was a different way of kind of moving the baby down. Again, just as I was like, all right, this is really great. She's like, all right, it's time to go do something else. And so then I labored on the ball for a little while. And Nicole's help in moving all these different positions was so great. We thought that the baby moved down definitely very quickly. And that was true with my my different checks that were going on. And looking back, I never would have done any of that on my own. I probably would still be clamped to the um, hospital bed to this day. <laughs> but Nicole's help with that was just amazing. So then at like 9.15, we did a cervical check and I was already at seven centimeters and the baby had moved down a lot. So definitely progressing pretty quick. And then uh, food showed up. My husband, my amazing husband, ordered a dozen donuts and egg sandwiches. He's like, do you want one? I was like, no, thank you. Like nothing sounded worse, but uh, I couldn't say that to him at the time. It was very sweet. Instead, I ate a honey stinger waffle, which is basically triathlon food, like nutrition. And I use it a lot. uh, So I knew it sat well in my stomach and Nicole was encouraging me to just at least get a little bit of energy from it, which I knew was important. And she also had me drinking water every 10 or 20 minutes, which was again, super helpful. I never would have thought of doing it on my own. It was one of those things like I probably knew somewhere in my head that I should be doing it, but in the moment, there's no way that I was going to execute on it. So it was really helpful. Just after that, my contraction started to get really strong I was vocalizing more and some of that helped. I had been doing some like low noises, which again, Nicole instructed me to do. And and those were also helpful. I still don't know how voice is connected to contractions, but somehow it is. And vocalizing more when those contractions were stronger also kind of made things feel better somehow. And uh, in my head, I also knew that listening to some birth hour podcasts, I heard other women were trying to kind of stifle those and, Uh, It made their clinicians not really believe them when they said it's time to push. So I was not afraid of people knowing that uh, the contractions were getting stronger. And I actually kind of intentionally wanted to make it known because I wanted the care if if I needed care. So I think the whole floor ended up finding out that I needed care because uh, I was pretty loud. And my husband said that he had no idea how good my lungs were. But I was hoping that the contractions, you know, they were really strong. And I was hoping that they were making quick work of things. The doctor definitely heard. So she was like, do you want to be checked again? And and I said, yes. And Nicole had been, every time that they were checking me, she's like, are you sure you want to get checked? And and I really appreciated her kind of stepping in for me. And because I know, I know I would have been super disappointed if I wasn't making progress with those different checks. And they can definitely inhibit labor, I've heard, if you're not making progress to get that information. But 
I'm also kind of a, a more information, the better kind of person. And, and luckily I was making a lot of progress. So it worked out for me. So they checked me again at 10 a.m. and I was already at nine centimeters. So four hours later, I went from four centimeters to, to nine centimeters. And then around then they, they kept asking me if I wanted to push. And I was like, maybe I, I feel like I could, but I don't know. So I, w- I went back to the laboring on the toilet and Nicole was relaying information from the toilet to the clinicians. And I just kind of kept laboring there for a while. And then they did another check and found my water hadn't broken yet. So I had this super big bulging bag of waters that they wanted to break. And they said that it would help relieve some of the pressure and, you know, make me feel a little bit better. But also would definitely kind of ramp up contractions and um, would most likely make me want to push. And I said, that sounds great. Let's do it. But they wanted to get one more round of antibiotics in. I was strep B positive. So I had been doing some IV antibiotics and they promised me that it would be 1030 and then they could break my waters after they got those antibiotics done. So I was watching the clock and then um, at like 1040, I was like, <laughs> I was like come on. But Around 1040, the doctor came in. She put on this huge waterproof suit. I mean, she looked like, I don't know where she she looked like she was like going into battle underwater with this big suit on. And she said she was basically ready for an explosion. And she uh, took her little plastic tool. It looked like a little knitting needle. I didn't feel anything except for when she actually broke my water. It was like a massive gallon sized water balloon going off. And, um, yeah, there's water everywhere, but the nurses came in quickly, whisked away the old checks pads and put in new ones. And it was then definitely time to push. So I felt like there was a little bit less kind of pressure in my belly. They had been kind of talking it up as breaking my water would make things less, I don't know, painful, but that wasn't the case for me. There was a little bit less, um, kind of fullness feeling in in my belly, which makes sense. So that was time to push. I wasn't super good at it at first. Again, first time doing this. And I know this was also pretty common um, for first time birthing people. So I'd actually written in my birth plan that I wanted feedback and coaching right away on pushing because I wasn't going to waste any time pushing ineffectively. So I'd started on my back, knew that that wasn't really a great position flipped over to my hands and knees and kind of rested up against the the headboard of the bed with a pillow. And that was more comfortable. And then at one point I was trying to push like that. All of a sudden I felt a finger in me that nobody had really asked if they could put there, but they said, you feel this, this is where you need to push. And I was like, Oh, okay. And that triggered my, um, you know, that told me where I needed to push. And I did one push and all of a sudden I got all these cheers and I was like, Oh, okay, I can do this now. So the real-time feedback was very, very helpful for pushing. But then right away after I started doing some of those good pushes, unfortunately, the baby's heart rate started decelerating, which was not good. So my husband had been looking at the monitor and his heart rate had been in the 140s and 150s. And then all of a sudden when I was pushing, it would drop down to like in the 80s. And everybody was pretty concerned about that, as they should be. So the doctor said, I needed to be much more effective at pushing and get him out very soon, or we would need to get him out another way. And, you know, after all this hard work, that was the last thing that I wanted. So I tried, I kept, you know, pushing really hard, still no major improvement in the baby's heart rate. So doctor looked at me and goes, you know, I really advise that we go to the OR just in case um, we need to either do a vacuum assist or a C-section. And I said, you know, that's, let's do it. That's what we need to do to get this baby out safely. So I moved onto a, a stretcher. They wheeled me down the hall. I had heard on, on another podcast, maybe a couple where women experience their labor kind of slowing down after getting out of that, you know, that nice, cozy labor and delivery room and being shoved into a hallway and then an OR. So I closed my eyes the entire time. I don't even know if we're on the same floor or where we went, but I had my eyes closed, showed up in this OR. And at one point we got to the OR and I still had my eyes closed because I kind of, I don't know, thought maybe I can just keep my eyes closed the entire time that we're in the OR. That wasn't exactly realistic. 
Uh, and the, the doctor was like, can you hear me? And I said, yeah, I can hear you. So, and I finally opened up my eyes and found myself in this freezing cold OR. I mean, it must've been 60 degrees, if not colder and super bright lights, fluorescent lights. I was on a tiny table. It was very clear that there would not be any, you know, experimenting with different positions on this little table because I would probably fall right off. And there were, I think, eight people in the room, which I think would have freaked out a lot of people. And the good thing was that all these nurses ended up being my cheer squad. I mean, I had three nurses on each side of me. I was, you know, on this tiny little table. My husband was at my back, um, kind of standing over my head. And then the doctor was by my feet. I also had another nurse who was sitting on a chair in the corner because uh, the baby had some meconium in the, the liquid. And so she was there for when the baby came out. And unfortunately, my doula couldn't come with to the OR because of COVID. They said that only my husband could come with and the doula had to stay back, which we were super bummed about. She really tried to protest it. You know, why could she be with in the labor and delivery room, but not in the OR? It was very confusing. But at that point, I mean, it was go time. It was like, we need to get this baby out right away. And there was no time to like, you know, argue too much. So I was on this table. They said, all right, we need you to do this certain kind of crunch as you feel a contraction. So it was one of the most athletic things I've ever had to do is laying on my back. And then with every contraction, I had to do a full body crunch where like I pulled my back up off the table. My legs were in the air. I was holding on to the back of my hamstrings. So I pulled my legs with my arms, did a full ab crunch and pushed as hard as I could. And with every contraction, the doctor wanted three really big pushes, like three 10 second pushes. And I could get out a fourth one every once in a while. And with everyone, I had these six nurses flanking the sides of me saying, you got this. That was such a good one. You can do it, mom. Like they were the most energetic and supportive group of people. It was amazing. I felt like I was in a cheer tunnel. (laughs) (laughs) It was um, just unreal. So after, you know, I did a couple pushes and the doctor said, for some reason, baby's heart isn't deceleration right now. So just keep pushing. If you can do this, we won't have to intervene. And I said, all right, you know, I'm a very competitive person. And I said, I'm going to do this. So I did these <laughs> crazy full body crunches. And about 10 minutes in, she said, we're really close. Baby's heart rate is, you know, starting to decel a little bit. Is it okay if I do a vacuum assist? It would maybe only be two or three pulls. And I think I can get them out. And I said, yes, do it. Do whatever you need to do. She also said, can I do an episiotomy? And I said, yes. I mean, whatever, you know, we just need to get this baby out. In my head, and my husband actually said out loud, do you want an episiotomy? Because it's in your birth plan. We've talked about this. We didn't want an episiotomy. I said, you know, if it's an episiotomy or a C-section, I want the episiotomy. Turns out baby's head was 14 inches in circumference, which is pretty big. And it was not going to get out without either a really big tear or an episiotomy. And um, I uh, did a couple of other really big pushes. The doctor said, he has hair. And I said, you can see him? <laughs> He's like, he has hair. Yeah, I could see him. And I was like, oh my God. And that was super motivating. They had set up a mirror for me, which I had said that I wanted early on in pregnancy. I was like, gross. There's no way I want a mirror. But they had set up a mirror and I could kind of see what was going on a little bit. But at the same time, it was really hard to do a crunch and push and look in the mirror at the same time. So anyway, the mirror was kind of out, but the doctor ended up doing one small vacuum pull and that got his head through and head was out. One more push, shoulders were out along with the rest of the body. And all of a sudden there's this purple slimy little baby flying through the air and it, in my arms. And it, it was just the best moment. Um, it was really, really special. And the best part was that he was healthy. Um, it turns out that the deceleration was because of uh, his cord being wrapped around his neck. And um, I was so, so happy that he was healthy. We had kind of, you know, a lot of ups and downs throughout. So I was just elated that, that he was here and um, everything was okay. I was kind of expecting to be more euphoric that I pushed out a baby, <laughs> which I had heard in a lot of other, you know, birth hour episodes and from other people. I think I was just more euphoric that um, everything worked out okay with him being delivered healthy. 
So uh, we did some quick skin to skin. He needed to be warmed up almost right away under a heater because it was so darn cold in that OR. And I was a little bit disappointed that my body wasn't, it heard that mom's body is supposed to warm up to heat up the baby. And I was like, come on, like, why didn't that happen with us? But he was under the, the heater for a little while, which was totally fine. They did all the, the checks and he had an APGAR score of nine. So again, super healthy. Um, we ended up being in the, the OR for a little bit longer. I got my first fundal massage, which was just as fun as everybody says. You know, it definitely wasn't as painful as birth, but um, it was not 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 painful. <laughs> uh, we also saw the placenta, which is crazy that I grew an organ and all of a sudden there it was on the table. <laughs> and then the last kind of complicating factor was there was a sponge that was lost in the OR. So there were originally 10 sponges in the OR. Now there were nine and nobody was allowed to leave the OR until that 10th sponge was found. They turned everything inside out. They checked me um, to see if the sponge was in me. Again, there was no surgery, but surprise, surprise, the sponge is not in me. And eventually it was found in a trash bin that was kind of rechecked three times. But finally we were let go from the OR, got to go back to the, the delivery room, got to see Nicole. Uh, she was so excited. She was really mad that she wasn't part of the birth. And I was definitely, you know, really disappointed that she wasn't there too, but everything worked out. Okay. So yeah, that was, that was the birth. Wow. That is amazing. Especially that end where you're just like, I got this triathlon person here. (laughs) (laughs) Let's do it. Yes. Oh, I loved all the detail you shared in. So great. Well, thanks. All right. So what about recovery? Let's talk a little bit about just postpartum in the hospital and then also once you at home. Yeah. So postpartum, uh, immediately in the hospital, it was just so busy. And yeah. I don't know how people do it. <laughs> I don't know how people do it without a pandemic because we were so crazy busy and it was, you know, we had fewer people than most people have. So mm-hmm. I was starving. I felt like I had just really like completed a triathlon and I didn't get to eat until 4.30 that day. Baby was born at 11.15. I didn't get to eat until 4.30. Except there were donuts <laughs> because my husband had ordered all those donuts and luckily there were lots of those still laying around. And then I you know, I tried to sleep. We tried to nap a little bit in the hospital that afternoon. I couldn't sleep. I just kept reliving the whole birth experience over and over and like crying and holding the baby. And it was just such a special um such a special moment. And to think about the entire thing and I don't know, it, it just took a lot to process it. And I was just, again, really, really thrilled. So that day we, we dropped off our cord blood. I was donating the um, cord blood. I uh, learned how to go to the bathroom, which is so funny. When a nurse came up and was I need to go teach you how to go to the bathroom. I was like, oh, I didn't know that I needed to be taught that anymore. But uh, turns out I did, which is very helpful. And then we, we were, you know, still thinking about names. It took us until the 11th hour the next day after um, being in the hospital for over 24 hours to, to pick a name. So we chose the name Emerson the next day. And uh, we got to meet, um, actually, Emerson's doctor, his pediatrician, happened to be on call that day doing rounds. So she did his check just a few hours after he was born. And then we, we went home the next day. I was on high alert for, you know, postpartum depression and anxiety and all of those mental and emotional things that are really common. And I was just elated. I I know a lot of it was hormones, but I have never been on such a high in my life. It was just so cool. I, for days, I would just hold the baby, nurse the baby, talk to him about his life, about everything that we were going to do, you know, his family and his friends who love him and basically everything that we should be excited about and everything to be grateful for. And it was, again, just like the happiest first three days. The first three days were really some of the happiest of my life. And then recovery was going pretty well. I loved my sits baths. I, I still don't understand when people say, oh, the sits baths are so annoying. I got to sit in a tub for 20 minutes twice a day and read books or journal. I wrote down my whole birth story. I watched Amy Schumer's pregnancy uh, documentary, which is also awesome. So those were great. I did Erica Zeal's physical therapy program, um, her core rehab program, which is also amazing. I highly recommend to everybody to just do some sort of physical therapy to, you know, help all those organs and all the inner damage that took place. 
I started doing a mom group, which was also just the most helpful thing. It was a, a program based here in the Twin Cities, but it was on Zoom because of COVID, so anybody can do it. It was uh, a group of four of us who all had babies within three weeks of each other. And they were super helpful, almost like a, a therapy group to kind of work through all this, you know, first time mom sort of stuff. And we acted like a troubleshooting team together. And we had a facilitator who had five kids of her own and, um, you know, was super qualified. And she taught us things about like baby sleep and, and some things that were really useful in the moment. So yeah, recovery went, went pretty well. My only kind of weird thing was I had a, a bruised tailbone, which in the hospital, people kept giving me ice packs and I kept putting it on, on my backside. <laughs> They're like, that's not where those are supposed to go. But <laughs> I didn't know that that was something that could happen. Mine actually went away pretty quickly, like within 48 hours. I know people who it took a lot longer to recover from that. But so yeah, I, I really took it easy for the first two weeks, like my doula kind of made me do. And, and I was very thankful for that. I recovered really well. And I quickly got back to my active lifestyle and now, yeah, running and biking and doing all the things that I used to do. So it was good. Awesome. Yeah. I was going to ask you about like, if you were sore in places you never knew you could be sore in from the way you described pushing. I was like, oh, I bet she felt that the next day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Luckily, it all bounced back pretty quickly. And I mentioned the episiotomy. I think, you know, I know that there are lots, lots of studies on episiotomies. My tear did heal up pretty fast. So, you know, my experience was actually a, a pretty good one with it. I'm not saying that I'd recommend it based on, you know, all the scientific data out there, but it actually worked out pretty well for me. Yeah, if you're able to rest for a couple of weeks. And I remember my midwife was like, just keep your legs together as much as possible. Like even getting out of bed, like swing your legs together off to the side and that kind of thing. Yep. So you really got to take care of yourself when you've had tearing or definitely an episiotomy. Yes. All right, well, you listed some great resources there for postpartum. Were there any others that you wanted to add? Yeah, a couple of resources. Some of my favorite books were Emily Oster's books, like everybody mentions, um, Expecting Better and Crib Sheet. I also really liked the Mayo Clinic Guide for a Healthy Pregnancy. And I'm not saying that because I'm a Mayo Clinic. <laughs> uh, it was just a really helpful, kind of more scientific backed. It's like a scientific and a clinically based book. So, you know, kind of less conversational, but more like what to expect from the medical side. Mm -hmm. In terms of birth, I got into some of the hypnobirthing kind of technique and, and mindset. I wish I had discovered that sooner. And then I, I have to put in a plug for the Birth Hour Facebook group and podcast. I still, to this day, I'm 16 month old and I still post things like, you know, who can help me figure out this situation? And, and it's just really nice to have that community where I can feel like I'm helping other new moms get through some of the, the things that I struggled with too. So yeah, I'll leave it at that. Awesome. Well, I'm so glad to have you in that Patreon group as well. And I'm the same way. My youngest is three now, just turned three, and I still get uh, help with certain things in there sometimes. So it's definitely not purely birth and pregnancy related. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. All right. And where's the best place for people to connect with you? Yeah. My Instagram is melissa.m as in Mary, dot Noel, N O E L. You can find me there. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much for sharing your story today, Melissa. It was so great. Thank you, Bryn. I'm honored. Now I'm going to chat with Ashley about Motif Medical's Luna Breast Pump. Hi, Ashley. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast today to chat with me about Motif Medical and their breast pumps. Thanks for having me, Bryn. Can you tell my listeners a little bit about you and your background? So my background is actually in nutrition, and I worked for WIC as a nutrition educator for a while and then um, became an IBCLC in about 2017. Um, I started my own business uh, at that time, probably just prior to getting my certification, just doing breastfeeding classes and, and um, support groups, things like that. I had my own little girl in 2015 and, and breastfed her for almost three years. So, um, I have, I have different perspectives kind of coming in from all angles and backgrounds when it comes to breastfeeding and, and, and support needed and, and that, that sort of thing. Um, when I revamped and, and kind of got a little bit more tech savvy with, um, 
you know, better promoting my, my own personal business, I was able to come in contact with um, Motif Medical. And they reached out wanting someone that kind of sees eye to eye with them as far as um, similar goals and um, similar outreach. And their approach is very similar to what I try to do. And that's um, trying to make breastfeeding feel more like something anybody can accomplish. You know, you don't have to be super granola or <laughs> uh, anything like that to, to want to breastfeed and breastfeed as long as you want um, or pump exclusively or, you know, anything like that. You know, they try to meet the mom where they're at and kind of give it more of a modern approach, which I that really, really speaks to me. So I've been working with them for a little over a year and a half now as their lactation director. And uh, a lot of their uh, blogs and information um, that's more medically geared or a little bit more um, in depth with lactation is written by yours truly. So it's it's a great collaboration and it's it's been an awesome journey working alongside them. It's a great team. Very cool. Yeah, I love all the content they're putting out to help educate as well. And so it's cool to know that you're behind that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they they always um, they always collaborate and come up with uh, topics that are relevant. And a lot of it is generated by questions from consumers and and people looking um, to get a better pump and that sort of thing. So it's it's questions coming from the source. So I know that you know by answering those things, you know I'm I'm answering things that are important to people that are reading it. Yeah, definitely. So you mentioned making breastfeeding, you know, a little bit less uh, daunting and more accessible. And I think that one of the big components when it comes to breastfeeding, obviously there's so much around getting the latch and milk supply and all that established in the beginning. But I also think that pumping is really overwhelming. It's this crazy contraption that you've never right. used before. You feel like you're, you know, being hooked up to like a dairy cow machine. <laughs> so what are some of the things you really like moms to know about pumping before they, you know, if they've never used one before? So I think being more, um, acquainted with your pump is important. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's if, if you can get one while you're still pregnant and, and you don't have the burden of trying to figure out motherhood, you know, a new baby mm -hmm. is very overwhelming, even if it's your second or third or fourth. Um, you know, if you got a new pump, take it out of the box, play around with it, you know, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, but, but something I really want to stress is, if you don't have a pressing need to pump, you don't have to pump right away. Right. Um, and I think I think having a pump or been, being given a pump um, while you're still in the hospital setting, perhaps, um, whatever the, the case may be, um, it, it's kind of like, well, it's there. Maybe I'm supposed to be using it. Mm -hmm. um, and then those questions of, well, how often and how long and should it? Should it fit a certain way? Should I use a certain strength? It just opens up a can of worms of all these questions. So, um I think first and foremost is be familiar with your pump if you have to use it and then figure out if you even need to use it in that time and, and not be afraid to ask questions when it is time to bring out the pump. There are people like myself who are at the ready to answer those kinds of questions and it's, it is so okay to ask. It's not a stupid question to ask about when and how and how often and all those sorts of things. It's very important to ask. Yeah, definitely. And I think that what you said about getting familiar with it even before baby is born is great just because there's so many pieces and you might actually take the time to read the directions and get all the parts put together properly versus, you know, sleep deprived postpartum and right. getting things in the wrong place. But I know for me, I didn't really, you know, truly pump until I went back to work. So, um, do you have any suggestions for people that are planning to be, you know, spending time away from their baby and needing to pump for that reason as far as like introducing the pump, like how much should you, you know, have stored and when should you start using it and that kind of thing? Absolutely. I think that's a pretty, um, that's a pretty anxiety inducing kind of thought process for many moms if they're not sure how to go about that. So if you know when you're going to be returning to work or know when you're going to be separated, uh, maybe you're traveling and not bringing baby with you for whatever reason, um, I, I think it's good to kind of have a plan of action, mm -hmm. but not let it overwhelm you. Um, I think we're all guilty of going on Pinterest or Googling and seeing um, freezers that are just packed full of stored milk and thinking, that's that's the the gauge. That's the rule of thumb of what you have to have in order to be away from your baby and be successful with pumping. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not the case. Um, so I think if you have a good week, 
two weeks ahead of when you are going to be away, that's a great time to start storing. Um, or to start beginning to, to that pumping process. Um, you don't have to do it from day one. You know, as soon as you have baby, if, if you're going back to work three and four months down the road, you know, start a week or two before you have to go. Depending on how well you respond to a pump, you might get away with only having to pump once or twice a day. And is it better to pump after baby eats or? That's a very common question. Um, I I think the best time is number one, first thing in the morning. Mm -hmm. And then if baby's still asleep, go ahead and pump Mm -hmm. as, as, as been my example, but everybody's different. So, um, the biggest thing to keep in mind is a lactating breast is never truly empty. Mm -hmm. And so emptied breasts as in expressed breasts make more milk faster Right. Supply and demand. (laughs) Exactly. So, you know, you don't have to feel super full to know that you still have milk. Um, And so a pump is not going to completely drain you. Mm -hmm. And if baby acts hungry and you've already pumped, you can still put baby to breast and offer to to, to nurse. Baby's going to get things out that the pump can't. And you're already replenishing what you've pumped out, too. So you've got that going for you, too. So um, trying to just take a deep breath and not overthink that part of it of, of the before after baby is fed, I think is very important too. You know, it's just keep in mind, you've got more there than what you were able to pump out. And something else to keep in mind too is, you know, you, you may be pumping for storage purposes, but you're, you're going to need to want to, you're going to need to pump even while you're away. So mm-hmm. that's going to be going to your, to your stash as well. Um, and that's for health purposes too. You can't be going, you know, four or more hours without pumping or expressing, so, you know, keep in mind, too, that that's going to be um, adding to your stash. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, um, as far as amounts needed, um, a baby that's under six months of age uh, averages about um, an ounce for every hour of the day. And now they may, they may go two and three hours in between feeds, so that means they take in two to three ounces of feeding. Mm-hmm. So you can use that calculation to figure out how many, how many ounces you need. If you're, if you're away for um, an eight-hour work day and it takes you 30 minutes to go to work and 30 minutes to get back, that's nine hours away from baby. So you need approximately nine to ten ounces of milk. It's not a lot when you break it down like that. It can kind of take the pressure off mom to, to, to have all of that prepared. Yeah, definitely. And I think that your point about pumping in the morning is so good because it can get really discouraging if you're not pumping as much in the evening. And so seeing those full bottles in the morning is good motivation, I think, to keep pumping. That's a great point. It kind of sets the day off Mm -hmm. to a very productive start. Yeah. So what have you seen with the Motif Luna? I've used this pump and I've used a lot of breast pumps over my three kids. And this has been by far my favorite. I just feel like it's super efficient. It's a million times quieter than some of the other ones I've used. And I find the flanges are really comfortable. But you've talked to a lot of moms that have used it. So what are you hearing about it and noticing yourself? Well, honestly, I'm hearing a lot of the same thing. Um, yeah. Moms are loving how quiet it is. I know that it's it's, it's um, kind of distracting enough when you're, you're – trying not to think about the fact that you're pumping, you're trying to relax, you're trying to, you know, maybe change your mindset on what's going on mm-hmm. so that you can have a better output. A quiet engine really helps that. And and the fact that it's still strong enough um, to double pump. And what I mean by that, if, if listeners aren't familiar with that term, um, this engine can keep up strength-wise um, having both hoses hooked up. Mm -hmm. So we, you know, we typically think of, uh, strength power, um, and it's, it, it makes sense that once that, that strength has been divided into two tubes versus it all going into one tube, Mm -hmm. if you're just pumping one side or the other, that it might lower a little bit. Mm -hmm. But what I've seen is it, it doesn't affect whether you pump one side at a time or both sides at a time. Um, and so moms are spending less time pumping, Mm-hmm. And they're getting they're getting milk out with this pump that they're not necessarily getting out with other other pumps that, that they may have tried if they've had that opportunity to compare. Um, so I think that's pretty remarkable to point out is this engine keeps up no matter if you're single or double pumping. Yeah, I've very, noticed very that I I can finish in about ten minutes versus maybe twenty with other pumps, and by twenty minutes my nipples are pretty uncomfortable. So I'm yeah. grateful for that faster pumping yeah. time for sure. 
Oh, that's fantastic. I mean, I, I hear that a lot. 10, 15 minutes, most moms are done. And mm-hmm. I mean, I don't even notice. Average. Like I realize, oh, nothing's <laughs> coming out anymore because I've been like, you know, checking emails or something. And I'm like, yeah. oh, I should turn this thing off. <laughs> so it's like a really efficient baby, which is really hard to mimic. Yeah. Oh, that's good. That's good stuff. Um, any tips for, I mentioned that the flanges are really comfortable for me on the motif. I don't know if I just mm-hmm. lucked out, you know, trying the best fit, but, um, any tips for that? If people are feeling like maybe they don't have a good fit, what should they be looking for? Yeah. Um, so I teach the, the, I love you sign with your hands, you know, the thumb, the index finger and the pinky mm-hmm. and the pinky being the, the smaller size, it's usually around a 21 millimeter. If your nipple is larger than that, and you think you might need to go a size up, you're feeling any pinching feelings or rubbing, that sort of thing, uh, go go a size up. You know, try a 24 millimeter or something like that. Um, the 27 is, is indicative of like the thumb size. So mm-hmm. we think 27 for the thumb, 24 for the index finger, and 21 for the pinky. And so use that to, to measure the diameter of your nipple. And if you see a bunch of rubbing going on on the narrower part of the flange, it's mm-hmm. time to, to move up a size. Um, or even down a size, if you're getting too much breast tissue, if, if it's clamping on the areola, you're actually kinking that hose, if you will, mm-hmm. um, if too much tissue is being gathered in there, or if there's a lot of rubbing going on. So playing around with different sizes if you need to, um, maybe even use a lubricant. I know some people use like a nipple balm or mm-hmm. coconut oil or something like that. Um, and putting and it actually on the flange, not just your nipples is something exactly. I learned, which I did not know with my first <laughs> <laughs> puppy experience. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I really appreciate you sharing that tip as well because it that that is a great a great little um word of advice. Some moms are just a little bit more sensitive or maybe they're kind of in between sizes, maybe they've got some fluctuations going on, maybe baby's been cluster feeding. There's different reasons why you might be experiencing um just a little bit more discomfort in times and not in others. So, you know, that's a great tool to have in your toolbox to mm-hmm. to make things a little bit more comfortable. Um Something else you can think about, too, is measuring each individual nipple. I've had plenty of moms that have to use two different sizes. So, oh, you yeah, know, good point. <laughs> they're, they're sisters. They're not twins. So, you know, yeah. make sure that you have the right size for each nipple. Um, yeah, there's, there's, you're, you're an individual. Always remember that. Yeah, I've, I think that that really goes to uh, the whole thing where people always talk about one side produces more milk, too. Yeah. It's just so interesting. And mine's been that way with three kids. It's always been the right <laughs> side is my big producer. So. The super boob. Yep. Yes. <laughs> yes. Sisters, not twins. And what's interesting, too, just a little side note there is with every pregnancy, the um, alveoli, the organs that actually store your milk, mm-hmm. um, get bigger and more numerous with each pregnancy. Oh. So. That it, it it could probably stand to say that we lactate a little bit easier with each pregnancy. Yeah, and it comes in faster, at least for me. <laughs> all right, well, thank you so much for sharing all this great um, advice with us. And then if you want to send any of your favorite um, articles you've written, I would love to link to those on the show notes page as well. Yeah, absolutely. We've got some great ones coming out. We're covering uh, the, the battery Uh, powered Luna um, and all of the great uh, versatility and conveniences that that offers without sacrificing, you know, strength and and all of that good stuff. So um, be on the lookout and I will, um, I'll send those links over to you. Yeah. I'm so excited for the battery powered version because that's like the one thing that uh, Motif didn't have. They have the smaller handheld battery one, but getting this, Mm -hmm. like you said, the full powered Luna with the battery operated option is really nice. It looks exactly the same. So we were talking about it before we started recording that there's not really any differences other than it's more convenient. So that's great. Exactly. Towed it around with you and, and If you've got other kiddos and you need to follow them around from room to room, you don't have to unplug or, you know, anything like that. There's just so many possibilities with this new option. I love that Motif has once again given us another option for our moms. Yeah, and the Luna's already, like, smaller and more lightweight than a lot of pumps. So I think having a battery-operated version just makes sense, too, because it's so portable already. It's perfect sense. Perfect sense. All right. Well, thank you so much again (laughs) for chatting with me today, Ashley. Oh, thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much again to Melissa for sharing her birth story with us and to Motif Medical for sponsoring this episode. You can head over to motifmedical.com slash birth hour to check out the Luna breast pump as well as their maternity compression garments. You guys have probably heard me talk about the Luna breast pump on my social media as well as on this podcast. And after having tried many different breast pumps, this is definitely my favorite one. So I encourage you to check that out and find out how you can get it for free through insurance as well. Again, that's motifmedical.com slash birth hour. 
And if you want more information from today's episode, just head over to thebirthhour.com and search for Melissa's name in the search bar to find her show notes page. Thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed today's show, head to thebirthhour.com and click become a member to pledge your support. And as a thank you, you'll get an invitation to join our private Facebook group and access to exclusive episodes. Your vote of confidence and support means the world to me.